far we have discussed about uh, some examples of steady flows uh, in the paradigm of low Reynolds number flow. Now uh, we will discuss something more about steady flows later on and uh, we will discuss about a theory which somewhat generalizes the elementary low Reynolds number hydrodynamics that we have discussed and uh, that theory is known as lubrication theory. So, we will discuss about that in details uh, later on, uh, but prior to that let us move into uh, some cases of unsteady flows. So, uh, let me talk about a little bit of motivation as we uh, discuss about the unsteady flows. So, uh, when we discuss about unsteady flows remember that whatever we are discussing here uh, is in the broad with the broad motivation of studying some examples related to microfluidics. So, we are proceeding towards that direction in many ways. Uh, now, uh, we will start with an example of an unsteady flow with a classical problem which is not a problem of microfluidics that is Stokes first problem. So, the Stokes first problem is something like this, you have a solid plate and there is a fluid over the top of the solid boundary. This fluid is initially stationary. Now, you suddenly pull the plate. with a particular velocity say u equal to u 0. Then because of the movement of this plate, there will be a disturbance in momentum in the fluid which will be propagated by virtue of the fluid property viscosity. So, we want to see that how does this momentum disturbance get propagated as a function of position and time that is as a function of the y coordinate and the time coordinate. Now, what is the relevance of this problem in microfluidics? See, this is not a microfluidic system. In fact, this is not a confined system. Now, in microfluidics, there are several effects which come into the picture. One possible effect is the effect of confinement. That is, if you make a plate coming on the top of this plate with a small gap between the two plates, then it becomes a confinement. So, the question is that how does the confinement affect the flow? To understand that, we will first solve this problem when we will consider that there is no confinement. See, if we want to understand what is the effect of confinement, First, we have to study that what is the scenario when there is no confinement and then in the next problem that we will be solving, we will put a plate at the top of this one. So, it becomes a confinement and we will see what is the difference between the results in the two cases and that will give us an indication of what could be a possible effect of confinement in unsteady flows. So, that is one of the classical motivations. I will talk about some more motivation later on. So, uh, we as, as we proceed, uh, so when we get a little bit bored with the mathematical exercise, we will talk about some practical motivation uh, to compensate for that. So, uh, uh, let us start this working out this problem by writing the governing equations. So, let us assume that the velocity u is a function of y and t. It is not a function of z because the plate is considered to be of infinite width. It is not considered to be a function of x 
that is not fully developed flow to be in a literal sense because fully developed flow we generally talk about in the context of internal flows that is flow through channels pipes and all this. But the notion is similar that there is a translational invariance that means if you want to look into the velocity field at this location the same velocity field will be repeated if you go to a different axial location. If you translate and move on to a different axial location that is called as translational invariance. So, with that u is a function of t and y or y and t whatever. So, this is equal to, so the left hand side of the Navier-Stokes equation will have this unsteady term, remaining terms will not be there because u del u del x plus v del u del y, if del u del x is equal to 0 and as a consequence from the continuity equation v is equal to 0 that we have already discussed. So, that means the remaining terms if u is not a function of x the remaining terms are not there, but unsteady term is there. That is the basic difference between the previous problems and this problem that there the unsteady terms were not there now the unsteady term is there. And uh, because of the length scales involved the dominant viscous term is the viscous term which is mu del 2 u del y 2. The x length scale is being much greater than the y length scale this term is dominating as compared to the gradients along x. There is no pressure gradient because it is like a infinite flow medium where it is subjected to like uniform uh, like atmospheric pressure from all sides. So, it is a open problem. Now, of course, I mean you can artificially impose a pressure gradient on, on this, but just like a flow over a flat plate you have the flow is acting uh, flow is being subjected to a zero pressure gradient that is also very similar to this. Now, as uh, we can clearly see that the problem is dictated by the kinematic viscosity. So, mu by rho uh, we can write this as nu and the problem is dictated by the kinematic viscosity. So, here what will be the time scale? The time scale will be we have discussed about three possible time scales the advection time scale, the diffusion based time scale and the forcing based time scale. So, here what will be the time scale? It will be the diffusion based time scale because you can clearly see that these two are competing with each other. Now, there is a time scale associated with the problem, but there is no natural length scale right there is no natural length scale involved. So, why is there no natural length scale involved? Because there is it is not in a confinement if it had it been in a confinement the height of the confinement would have been the natural length scale, but it is an unconfined medium this is like in this is extended up to infinity. So, there is no natural length scale, but it is important to figure out that what could be a possible natural length scale based on the time scale. So, what is that length scale? Length scale means the distance up to which the effect of this movement of this plate will be felt right. So, question is that on which factor is that distance related? One of the critical factors on which it is related is time right. So, if you allow more and more time more and more fluid in the outer layer will feel the effect of the plate right. Theoretically if you allow infinite time all the fluid will feel the effect of the plate, but in a very short time only a small extent or a short depth from the plate will feel the effect of the solid boundary ok. So, time is an important parameter. Is there any other important parameter? Yes, kinematic viscosity we have discussed about that. 
that more is the kinematic viscosity more will be the effect or the penetration depth of the effect of the movement of this plate. So, the length scale up to which the disturbance due to the motion of this plate will be felt should be increasing with time and should be increasing with kinematic viscosity, but exactly how to understand that we will make an order of magnitude analysis of this equation very simple analysis. So, what is the order of magnitude of this term? U reference is U0 by T reference, this is of the order of nu U0 by Y reference square. So, Y reference scales with square root of nu t reference. Okay. That means, although there is no natural length scale in this problem, but the length scale is eventually decided by the kinematic viscosity and the time scale. Okay. So, from here we can qualitatively expect that u by u 0 will be a function of y by y ref and this function is expected to be self similar. This is very much analogous to the boundary layer theory, where velocity profiles like if you if you draw an analogy with the boundary layer theory, if you have this as the boundary layer velocity profiles at various locations are indeed very different, but if you non dimensionalize or normalize the velocity profile u by u infinity as a function of y by delta this being delta this being the new delta at the new location. So, u by u infinity will be a single valued function of y by delta here the delta is this one. that is the penetration depth just like the boundary layer. Okay. So, u by u infinity is like u 0 here is a function of y by delta. Since this delta it is a function of t right this we could get from a physical intuition. So, we can write that u by u e u 0 is a function of y into a function of t right. This g t roughly scales with 1 by delta. Okay. So, we can because it is a single valued function of this we can write replace this with a variable eta which we call as a similarity variable okay. and seek for a solution and when you express the solution in terms of this similarity variable again just like method of separation of variables the similarity transformation the objective is to convert the partial differential equation into ordinary differential equation. Because if you are able to express this as a function of eta as a single variable, then it will be a u by u 0 will be a function of a single variable only. Question is, is it always true? I mean, is it always possible to cast this type of PD into in, in the form of an ODE like this? It depends on the physical situation on hand. In this physical situation, it is possible. So, I mean, uh, there are situations when they, that may not be possible, but here the physics is giving us or driving us towards this kind of variable separation. Now, we will uh,
proceed with the solution of this problem. So, u by u 0 is a function of eta, where eta is equal to y into g t. So, what is del u del t? u 0 d f d eta into del eta del t right using the chain rule. So, del eta del t is y into g dash right, where d g dash means d g d t. Then uh, del u del y del u del y why we require del u del y because we need to evaluate this term. So, del u del y u 0 d f d eta into del eta del y. So, u 0 d f d eta into g. So, what is the second derivative? Second derivative is u 0. So, you basically make d d eta of this into del eta del y. So, another g will come. So, it will be u 0 d 2 f d eta 2 into g square. Okay. So, let us then write this equation del u del t that is u 0 d f d eta to y g dash is equal to nu del 2 u del y 2 nu u 0 d 2 f d eta 2 into g square. And what is y? y is eta by g right. This y is nothing but eta by g. u 0 gets cancelled from both sides. So, g dash by nu g cube is equal to d 2 f d eta 2 by eta d f d eta. Right? So, we have clubbed all functions of t in on one side and all functions of eta on one side. So, this is function of t only. This is function of eta only. So, these two are the same only if it is a constant.
So, let us say that the constant is C. So, we can write dg dt g dash is dg dt then 1 by nu g cube is equal to c. So, g to the power minus 3 dg is equal to nu c dt. So, g to the power minus 2 is equal to by minus 2 is equal to nu c t plus c 1. Now, we have to remember that what is g? So, g is what? g is 1 by g is the penetration depth at a given time, right. So, at t tends to 0, what is g? At t tends to 0, the penetration depth is what? The penetration depth is what? 0. So, g is 1 by the penetration depth that will tend to infinity. So, at t tends to 0, g tends to infinity that means c 1 will be 0. So, you have g is equal to 1 by minus 2 nu c t square root. All right. So, you can see so this is the beauty of scaling analysis. Say a rigorous mathematical analysis has given rise to this form of g, but you could tentatively get this form without going into this mathematical analysis simply by scaling the two terms that are appearing in the governing differential equation. So, you will clearly get that g scales with 1 by square root of nu t. Remember that g is 1 by y reference y reference is scales with square root of nu into t reference that is what is sort of supported or justified by this more detailed mathematical treatment. Now, the question is what is the value of c that you, you may take? So, only restriction is that c has to be negative because this g has to be a real number. So, C must be negative. So, what is the typical choice of C? So, that depends on convenience. So, you may choose for example, C, uh, C is equal to minus half or 2, minus 2 like that. So, that you know the square root business goes off. So, as an example, let c is equal to minus 2. So, then remember this is not a must, this is just an one example. So, whatever c you will take, it does not disturb this equality. So, you recall that in school level ratio proportion problems, a by b equal to c by d equal to k, whatever k you take, that does not disturb the equality of a by b and c by t, that is what, that is, what is important. So, this equality is never disturbed because of the presence of this c. So, for different c, the solution of g will be affected and the solution of f will be equally affected. So, uh, I mean different c's will eventually give rise to the same solution. So, you will have g is equal to uh, minus 2 as an example. So, uh, c is equal to minus 2 as an example. So, g will be 1 by 2 square root of nu t.
this is about g now let us concentrate on f Okay. So, you can see that we have now been successful in converting the P D into an O D. We will write the boundary conditions uh, immediately, but before that we will just integrate these ones. So, uh, the boundary conditions maybe we can write first and then integrate. So, what are the boundary con conditions of this at eta equal to 0? what is f? f what is the definition of f? Definition of f is u by u 0, right? u by u 0 is f. So, at eta is equal to 0 what is u? u is u 0 no slip boundary condition, right? You have to be careful here the plate itself is moving. So, no slip boundary condition does not mean that the fluid is stationary. It means the fluid is stationary relative to the solid boundary, right. So, if the solid boundary is moving with a velocity u 0, the fluid will also move with the same velocity u 0. That is what is the no slip boundary condition. So, if u is equal to u 0, then what is u by u 0? 1. So, at eta is equal to 0, f is equal to 1 and at eta tends to infinity f will be 0 because far away from the plate effect of the disturbance of the plate will not be felt. So, the velocity will be 0. So, our problem definition boils down to this. Now, to solve this problem, I mean it is a very straightforward solution. Let d f d t uh, d f d eta is equal to some h. Let so you have d h d eta plus 2 eta h is equal to 0. So, d h by h is equal to minus 2 eta d eta. So, ln h if you integrate is equal to minus eta square plus ln of uh, c 2. We have already uh, used a constant c 1 for this problem. So, let us give it a name c 2. So, h is equal to c 2 into e to the power minus eta square. what is h? h is d f d eta. So, what is f? c 2 e to the power minus eta square d eta plus c 3. Now, we will apply the boundary conditions. So, thus these boundary conditions let us give names this is boundary condition number 1 this is boundary condition number 2.
So, the boundary condition 1, what does it say? The boundary condition 1 says that at eta equal to 0, f is equal to 1. So, that means C 3 is equal to 1. Okay. So, you have f is equal to 1 plus c 2 integral 0 to eta e to the power minus eta square d eta. Okay. Then we apply the boundary condition that at eta tends to infinity f tends to 0. So, the boundary condition 2 0 is equal to 1 plus c 2 integral 0 to infinity e to the power minus eta square d eta. Then we can make a substitution that eta square is equal to z. So, eta is equal to z to the power half that means d eta is equal to half z to the power half minus 1 dz. So, 0 is equal to 1 plus C 2 by 2 integral 0 to infinity e to the power minus z into z to the power half minus 1 dz. By definition, 0 to infinity e to the power minus z into z to the power n minus 1 dz is gamma of n. So, this is gamma of n is equal to half gamma function of half and gamma half has a value of root pi. So, C 2 becomes minus 2 by root pi. So, f becomes what? 1 minus 2 by root pi integral 0 to infinity e to the power minus eta square d eta. Right? this function is what? This is the error function of eta, E r f eta. Hmm? Sorry, 0 to eta, right, not 0 to infinity, yes, 0 to eta. So, we write the solution here f is equal to u by u 0 
is equal to 1 minus error function of eta where eta is equal to 1 by 2 root nu t. So, 1 minus error function eta is also called as complementary error function. ERFC. So, that completes the solution of the Stokes first problem. Now, how will the velocity fields vary? We will look into that, but as we are doing for most other problems, we will recapitulate through the slides what we have done for the Stokes first problem and then we will look into the graphs which will uh, give the solution for this velocity field basically a visualization or the plotting of this velocity field. So, uh, uh, if you look into this, so we have uh, used this similarity transformation uh, and I am just browsing through it. So, now we can see uh, you can uh, so in the uh, similarity variable transformation we have uh, written f as a function of eta and g as a function of time we have separated these variables and then we have integrated to find out that expression for g c can be any negative real number we have chosen c equal to minus 2. Then uh, we have uh, considered the governing equation for f and uh, we have integrated the governing equation for f uh, by assuming by letting f dash is, is equal to h and uh, then that has given rise to the solution by uh, substituting the necessary boundary conditions and these boundary conditions eventually give rise to the solution that f is equal to 1 minus error function of eta. Okay. Now, it will be interesting to see how the solution looks graphically. So, if you look into this graph, you will see that u by u 0 as a function of y by 2 root nu t, you see that the effect of y and time, effect of position and time they are coupled. So, that is the first important observation. See, if you are asked that what is the value of velocity at a given y, then it depends on what is the time. So, if you allow more and more time, the same velocity will be appearing at a greater depth from the plate. The simple reason is that at greater time, more and more amount of fluid will now feel the influence of the solid boundary. Okay. So, if you have higher value of t, you will get a higher value of y for which the same velocity effect is felt. That is why, when you map the solution u by u 0 as a function of y by square root of nu t that uh, coefficient 2 is of course, not that important from a conceptual point of view from, from a mathematical data point of view that is important, but concept wise it is y by square root of nu t. That dictates that what will be the solution of the velocity uh, as a combined function of position and time. Now, uh, if you are interested to plot the velocity in a dimensional plane, not in a dimensionless plane. So, that is shown in the second graph, where you plot for some problem u as a function of y for different time. So, you can see, so look at these extreme diagrams. Uh, extreme curves. So, the first one say this is for a short time t is equal to 0 0.1 second. So, only a small depth from the solid boundary feels the effect of the plate, but as you allow more and more time say t equal to 4 second for the particular data that has been assumed, you can see that now the penetration depth is much beyond what it was for 0 0.1 second. So, the penetration depth becomes more as you allow more and more time and it 
depends critically on the kinematic viscosity. If the fluid has a greater kinematic viscosity at a given time the penetration depth will be more. So, that is what we have learned from the Stokes first problem. Now, the thing is that this problem is very interesting and uh, classical. Now, how can we relate this problem with microfluidics? So, we will consider a problem which is a little bit deviated from the Stokes first problem, but has some kind of notional relevance with that. So, in the Stokes first problem, you had a solid boundary moving towards a particular direction with a velocity then what we do is that to if consider the effect of confinement we put another plate which is on the top of this so this is in the steady state the classical quet flow problem. You have flow between two parallel plates, one of the plates is moving relative to the other with a particular velocity and that is the classical quet flow. Now, we are interested in the unsteady solution of this problem, not really the steady solution. Now, question is many times this, this kind of question comes to our mind that when we study fluid mechanics these kinds of classical problems are always introduced and microfluidics is of no exception. So, people might talk about that well in the introductory lectures in microfluidics on one hand you talked about cell, DNA, these, that and suddenly you are going to an abstract problem when a plate is moving relative to the other what is the physical relationship between these two and I think I have a responsibility to discuss about that before entering into this problem. So, now in teaching pedagogy it is important that we discuss about certain things in the context of why we are studying that. So, when we are studying quiet flow for example, forget about steady or unsteady, when we are studying quiet flow the basic reason that should come to our mind the basic question that should come to our mind is that why are we studying quiet flow that relevance should be brought in when we are studying a poisonly flow or again poisonly flow that motivation is very clear that you have a pressure gradient driven flow and you in reality in engineering systems you may have a pump to drive the flow so that motivation is quite clear but when you are thinking of a quiet flow that motivation is not very obvious. Where have you seen somebody pulling a plate on the top of a fluid and moving the fluid uh, in that direction? I, mean, I have not seen any, anybody doing that. I do not know uh, uh, whether I will come across that example in the, in the remaining part of uh, my professional career, but I have never seen that. But I have seen people pumping water through pipes and channels that I have seen. So, somebody is suddenly pulling the plate in a particular direction and allowing the fluid to move of course, you can make such actuators not by somebody uh, literally manually doing it, but doing it by a mechanism that is possible, but there is actually a broader motivation towards this. So, when we work out the steady state solution of this problem you will see that the shear rate like if you set up your x, ax, x axis in this direction and y axis in this direction, the shear rate will be u 0 by h and the steady state velocity profile will be linear. I mean from your undergraduate studies you already know about that and we will uh, revisit that quickly while working out the unsteady state solution. So, then 
uh, if the shear rate is a is u 0 by h you can control the shear rate by controlling u 0 or by controlling h. So, that means you and this flow is acting this is a pure quiet flow without pressure gradient you can have a quiet flow with a pressure gradient that is called as quiet Poiseuille flow that is a combination of pressure gradient and the this effect. So, this effect is what giving what it is giving rise to a shear rate which is a constant or the rate of deformation which is a constant. So, you can have a designed rate of deformation or a rate of shear on the flow and then study what is the response of the flow against that rate of deformation. So, this is called as shear driven flow just like pressure driven flow this is a shear driven flow and this is just one manner in which you can impose the shear by moving a plate. But if you could apply the shear by whatever by a different mechanism and study the shear driven flow mechanism study the response of the system against that shear then if you have shear of this magnitude then the response to the system you can study as a function of shear of this magnitude which can be controlled independently by u0 and h. Not only that you can see like all of you have seen that you have a parabolic velocity profile for a fully developed pressure driven flow. Now, let us say that that this dimension is over a few millimeters. Let us say there is a biological cell which is sitting on the wall of this channel. This is let us say this is few centimeter or millimeter this is like say this is what around 10 micron roughly. So, over the span over which this cell is sitting you can approximately linearize this velocity profile. So, a small part of the parabola is like a straight line right a very small part of the parabola this is actually this is exaggerated in the figure, but this is actually very small. So, that means if you have a cell sitting on the surface of a blood vessel and is subjected to shear of a given amount then what is the response of the cell against that shear. If you want to study that this can be one of the basic mechanisms of probing the fluid mechanics in, in, in presence of that kind of physical situation. Okay. So, you can see just I just wanted to I, I mean I can get into deeper discussions on this, but we will not spend much more time on this before getting into the mathematical analysis, but my whole objective of uh, telling this is to convey this information to you that whenever we are doing mathematics for solving a problem never try to think that we are doing mathematics for the sake of doing mathematics. So, we have to keep in mind that there is a broad picture in mind and the broad picture is a very complicated picture to get the essential physics of the broad picture to begin with we can simplify the problem to a considerable extent and, and study the essential si simplified problem of relevance and that is one of the motivations of studying the quiet flow. Now, the governing equations are still very similar as the previous problem right because putting a solid boundary at the top does not change the governing equ equation it changes the boundary condition. So, the governing equation is still this one, but what is the most fundamental difference between the previous problem and this problem right the, the length scale. In the previous problem there was no natural geometrical length scale the length scale was a function of the time scale. Now, here there is a natural length scale which is the height h. Still one may argue see these are deeper and deeper discussions I am trying to get into these and to ignite ideas in your mind. Now 
you have seen the solution of the Stokes first problem for very short time. For very short time, the penetration depth is very short. Let us say this h is greater than the penetration depth. Then this plate is actually as if located at infinity, although it is not literally infinity. See, when we say math in mathematics, something tending to infinity in physics we mean that it is far field that means it does not feel the influence of the forcing effect it does not feel the effect of the influence of the forcing effect that is what is far field or infinity so infinity does not literally mean that it has to be dimensionally infinity so it may so happen that the penetration depth at a given time is shorter than this h but in a microfluidic situation we are not we are not going to practically encounter such a situation because for the practical times whatever we will be considering the penetration depth will be greater than this micrometer dimension typically this is a very short dimension so in microfluidics that we are interested about studying this problem independent of the stokes first problem provided this h is a natural length scale otherwise it becomes the stokes first problem itself so, with that motivation that we want a separate grasp of this particular problem, we consider that h is the natural length scale. So, what is the? So, if we do an order of magnitude analysis for this particular problem, what is the order of magnitude of this? u0 by t ref. What is the order of magnitude of this? nu u0 by y by h square y ref square is h square so t ref is of the order of h square by nu okay so this is what this is the diffusion base time scale. <coughs> so, we non dimensionalize the problem we non dimensionalize the problem and write u bar that is non dimensional u is equal to u by u 0 non dimensional y is equal to y by h and non dimensional t is equal to t by h square by nu. See it is possible to non dimensionalize by using different parameters you could use here an advection based time scales also to, to, to non dimensionalize, but if you use the non dimensionalization parameter as the correct physical parameter then the solution gives the correct physical meaning directly otherwise it needs further interpretation. So, now del u del t is what del u del u bar del u bar del t bar into del t bar del t so u bar by this is t ref in short we are writing this is t ref del u del y what is del u del y del u del u bar into del u bar del y bar into del y bar del y 
this is what? So, this is u 0 by h into del u bar del y bar. Del square u del y square is basically u 0 by h square into this. another differentiation with respect to y. So, if you write this equation, then del u del t is equal to u 0 by t ref Okay. u 0 gets cancelled from both sides and t ref is h square by nu. Right? So, you can cancel t ref h square by nu. So, we will get that equation del u del t non dimensional is equal to del 2 u del y 2 non dimensional. Okay. Both of these terms are of the order of 1, because the non dimensional parameters are so chosen that non dimensional u is what u by u 0 that is of the order of 1, non dimensional y y by h that is of the order of 1. So, all the terms are of the order of 1. Now, this problem will have a steady state solution and an unsteady solution. When will the unsteady solution be relevant? The unsteady solution will be irrelevant theoretically when we go t tends go to t tends to infinity. So, at t tends to infinity we will get the steady state solution which is the solution for the quet flow. So, the general solution will be sort of the unsteady part of the solution plus the steady part of the solution where the unsteady part of the solution should tend to 0 as t tends to infinity. So, we will work out the steady state solution separate it from the unsteady solution and then separately work out for the unsteady solution which should asymptotically vanish as t tends to 0 uh, infinity. So, we will take this up in the next lecture for the time being we stop here today. Thank you very much.